Welcome back to the Zero to Five Million Dollar Podcast. My name is Ollie Whitford, and today I'm on my own. I have no co-host. I do have a guest, and I'll introduce him to you in a moment. But as always, this show is brought to you by. Uh, I butchered that. This show is brought to you by Order Clothes, a vanilla soft company. You can tell we do live TV. We keep in the mess ups in my intro, but. I said I have a guest today. We're getting back heavy on the guests. We've had a little while where we did debates, we did all kinds of stuff, and now we're back to the guests. So actually, as a day of talking to this gentleman, my podcast with him comes out tomorrow. So I'm looking forward to that. And it wasn't long ago that we were sat here talking about some similar stuff, but with right. my side of the story explained. Mm-hmm. So welcome, Derek Williams, to the podcast. How are you doing? Hey, thanks. I'm doing good. Thanks for having me in. My pleasure. So I don't know where to start with you. Um, maybe at the start of your journey doing what you do right now. Tell, tell us quickly, what do you do? And when did that start? And, and why did you start doing it? Okay. Um, so today I run an independent consulting agency focused on sales development, specifically around helping companies either implement their first sales development team. Companies are usually sub 10 million uh, or helping manage temporarily a SDR team. So I come as a fractional leader in those instances. So it's either implementation or improvement effectively. Um, in addition to that, I have uh, a, two other lines of service that I offer. I do sales technology consulting. So I'm certified in sales force a couple of times, uh, sales loft and partnered up with other technology vendors. So I'll help organizations just in some cases stand up their tech stack, their CRM, do migrations, that sort of thing. And uh, the third is training. So, you know, one-off trainings, group trainings, that sort of thing uh, for SDRs and SDR leaders. So those are the three lines. Mm-hmm. Cool. So um, when did this happen? What, what was the situation? You, you quit a job, you have like some, some time where you wanted to give it a go, side hustle that became big. What, what's the deal? Yeah, well, actually, I got laid off a crap ton of times uh, as an SDR manager and realized that uh, companies at a certain stage that were doing sales development for the first time needed a more flexible option. Uh, our teams, the teams that I had led as an SDR leader were successful. We booked meetings, we created new opportunities. However, there were other surrounding circumstances as to why the company might go into a retraction mode and, you know, sort of decrease the number of SDRs that they had in their SDR leadership. So, you know, whether or not it's interoperability or maybe it's just a closing problem or other organizational issues that were preventing them from scaling. Yeah, sales development became one of those experiments that uh, gets downsized in, in some cases. So a smarter way of going about it is leveraging someone who has more experience, who's been there a bunch of times, who's you know seen the failures, had the successes, um, but also is temporarily uh, in place. So you're not long term committed to an SDR manager who maybe doesn't have the experience of building out teams and who you kind of locked in and committed to for for some time as an full-time employee. So uh, yeah, I, that, what really happened was uh, I was running full cycle sales teams and as an inside sales manager, got recruited by a startup to a secu- cybersecurity company. They wanted to scale out their SDR team. Um, they had three when I inherited the team and we grew to 13 global presence, booking meetings like, at scale. It was uh, a lot of fun. Uh, it was my first SDR team. I had been running you know, sales teams before that, but uh, then about a year, year and a half into that, uh, as I mentioned, they've faced some headwinds. And so they downsized. I was laid off. I went to another company, ended up being a cybersecurity company. I was in the Silicon Valley. That's kind of where I was born and raised. And same thing happened almost to the T, right? Almost a year later, uh, same thing happens. And then this happened consecutively at three, four or five companies. And I realized that I was putting my, the, my future in the hands of other people yeah, but at the same time, I had developed a really refined skill set. So, um, yeah, I decided to start my own thing. Now, the backdrop, though, is that in 2008, I formed the business before any of this ever happened. I always knew I wanted to be a sales consultant, sales trainer, but I didn't know what lane I was going to pick. I knew there was some dichotomy there and I was early in my career. I needed to learn more, but I was very intentional about this entrepreneurial path that I wanted to take. So early, early on, on the heels of a divorce, actually, uh, I said, you know, I'm taking the bull by its reins and I'm going to, you know, take control of my life. I'm going to start this business. And so 2008, I start the business. I go through my career, I go through these, you know, uh, layoffs. And then 2016, I secure my first client. Okay, cool. So what what I like a lot about your story, particularly literally the way you described it, it's like not glorious to not be laid off. 
but you've turned it into something that's very normal. So in a lot of cases, people think of, I started this business as this like huge grand moment where you had a light bulb hit you and, and you're like, oh my God, I've got this crazy idea. It's got to, it's going to change the world, right? Right, right, right? That's like very few companies and they're the big ones, like very, mm. very few of them. There's so many people like you who have been in the workforce, just like me and other people who work on our team and other companies and, and people like you listening who made a go of it themselves because the phrase that I love that you said is I wanted to take control yeah. rather than have someone else own my own destiny. I love that. That's, that's awesome. So I like how you did it. So take me forward to that point where you got the first client. How, how did you get them? Uh, I'm assuming you exhausted your referral network because that's what I do straight away. <laughs> right. But right, past right. that, what, what did you do? How, how do you start to get some more? Well, I mean, I think you have to go back and focus on the fact that I was, no ego here, but I was a really good seller. I was successful as an individual contributor. I frequently was promoted in my career to you know, management positions, to senior sales positions. And so um, that's the first thing is I had to establish my track record. And I knew that early days that if I wanted to own a business specializing in sales, I better sure be good at selling, right? So uh, that was number one. Then I socialized it a lot. So often in an interview, for instance, you might be asked, what's your five-year goal? And I'd always say, I want to have this sales consulting firm. I don't know exactly what it looks like yet, but I want to be training. I want to be working with salespeople who you know, may have struggled early days like I did. And that's how I got my first client because along the way of socializing, it was actually um, a VP of sales that I reported into and uh, I had left the company, been laid off. And, but I was, this is the time where I was jumping off and like, I'm not going back. And he knew that it was one of those times where I had gone through the ringer a bunch of times. And so in our QBRs and our one-on-ones and we would travel on business, we, this would come up often. He knew this was an intentional thing of mine. And so uh, a friend of his was an interim CEO for a company, wanted to build out an SDR team. And through their relationship, he thought of me because one thing I always try to tell people, it's not what you know, it's not who you know, it's who knows what you do more specifically. And so he knew what I did and what I specialized in. And so when that conversation happened, uh, he reached out to me and said, hey, are you still trying to do that consulting thing? I have someone that might be interested. And uh, yeah, I was able to secure that as the first client. It was the, the, you know, getting the professional services agreement written up, writing the scope of work, you know, doing that whole bit. It was the, it was the first time. And yeah, that, that engagement lasted just over a year. Uh, it started out building on an SDR team, which we did successfully hired a couple SDRs who were doing lead conversion and pipeline generation. Uh, and then it segued into uh, a Salesforce mapping project. So the back half of the engagement was just remapping their sales process because they had got brought in an actual full-time CEO and he wanted to revamp things. And so uh, we remapped their sales process conceptually and then mapped that into their Salesforce instance, both, you know, in the sales cloud, all the way to the service cloud. And uh, yeah, so that's, that was the first client. Good stuff, man. Um, as, as my phone, I've got the same number as just rang me four times. That's great. And it's a, <laughs> it's a cold caller, but Fair enough. I can't answer it when I'm on a podcast. That's not a rebuttal. <laughs> well, you know what? If you put them in speaker, let's see what he has to say. If they do, I will do it again. If they do call back, I will <laughs> I will say, hey, you're on the zero to five million dollar podcast. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Go. <laughs> we should do that at some point. Maybe we should do one where we coordinate to have callers yeah. hit us up. That We're taking cool. cold calls at this time. Please feel free to solicit us. You may or may not be recorded. <laughs> okay. So um see so you're basically the power of speaking into existence a little bit and who you know, and they know that you do it because you've talked about it and you've said it and then you start to do it. Plus their, their awareness of how good or, or not you are at that and their willingness to recommend. Then you start to sell basically because you're a salesperson. So you've got to be able to sell if that's your work. Has the model changed though? Like how do you package up what you do? So you said one client and it lasted about a year or so. Mm -hmm. Can you take on three? Can you take on 10? Do you plan to have a change in that number or, or what you do and how you do it? Well, it's a, it's, it's a good question. It all depends on the mix of the engagement. A full implementation has uh, peaks and valleys. It usually lasts about four months, five months to go from, you know, concept and idea of having an SDR team to having, you know, two, three, four people converting, you know, consistently every month. And so during certain phases, like when we're hiring, we're actually gone through the design phase and built it all out and we're actually going to hiring that's when it gets really intense because you're doing a bunch of interviews we're reviewing a lot of applications 
And so the, the bandwidth in, at, that, at that point in the engagement gets a little tight. So it depends on where I am with other engagements too, right? If I'm at the hiring phase on three engagements, then I'm taxed. But a lot of times they're staggered. So I might be in the assessment mode, just uncovering, trying to understand the business, piecing together how we're going to des- design this. And that's less uh, intense. Right. And so another engagement might be at another phase. And so that staggering effect allows me to get to three, four, five clients. And then some, you know, engagements, as I mentioned before, don't require a lot of, uh, FaceTime interaction. For instance, if I'm doing a fractional management engagement, uh, where I'm coming in for a few months to help manage an SDR team and help provide some coaching and TLC, then there's a lot of one on ones. It could be a team of 10 SDRs. And so I'm doing one-on-ones with each one of them every week. We're doing team meetings. So again, that's you know a little bit more taxing. Generally speaking, I try to stay at around three engagements if I'm doing a sales development consulting. But then if I'm doing some sales tech and some sales training, those are uh, easier to mix in. But yeah, it, from a consulting standpoint, the most I've done is like seven and I was working 60 hours a week. Okay. Yeah, I can see that getting a little bit hectic, especially as the up season comes, one of them. The thing about it, though, is the more if I'm not doing it too much, I feel like I get better in that situation, though, because I'm talking to so many teams and simultaneously that I'm advancing, you know, my wherewithal and what's working, what's not. uh, I'm picking I'm learning a lot from these engagements, too. Right. And so it speeds up my ability to to advise. But, yeah, three is kind of the sweet spot, because part of this is. up until recently, I've, my goal has been to have it be just a lifestyle business where I could work from home, spend my time how I want to. My wife works from home as well. Um, so being able to have more time with family and that sort of thing was kind of the driver. Because as you know, when you're a full-time seller or a sales leader and you're an organization, consistently year after year, you're working 60 hours a week. It's just the norm. And so you're always gone and always tucked away in the office, if you will. So this was my way of being able to make what I was making or more and have more time. So, but now I'm in the mode where, you know what, I think I'm a little more hungrier than that and uh, I'm ready to ready to scale up. But uh, yeah, no, that's, that's kind of how I manage it overall. Okay. So one thing I was, as you were describing the bandwidth thing that I was trying to think in my mind, how, how does this break? Like, how do you come into a problem with this? There's like with any person facing um, service businesses, obviously a, you can't work 200 hours. So you've got to either up price or, or have scarcity in one way or another. Is there a way or have you thought about, let's say you've got that three, four, five clients. You could mid max it a little bit, but you've got to like sell at the perfect time and have the engagement start at the perfect time and everything go perfectly so that the busy season doesn't overlap have you got like side products that help sort of fill in that gap a little bit? Not passive income, but you know what I mean? It's mm. like backdoor, just money coming yeah, in every that's now like and the, then. The, yeah, that's like the, to me, that's the sales technology stuff. Like standing up a Salesforce instance for a small sales team, I can do in my sleep, I feel like, you know? So I, and a lot of that's during off hours. I don't need to do, that's what I mean by the, it doesn't have a lot of FaceTime required. In the evenings, that's what I'm doing. You know, early mornings, that's what I'm doing. Uh, and it's, some people like to play video games at night and binge watch TV. Uh, I like geeking out on on setting up tech and Salesforce and HubSpot and these kinds of things. It might sound weird, but I'll turn on house music and you might hear my office and I'll just kind of go to town on it. So, And I'm a workhorse. I think I'm a little unique that way. And that's why it's kind of caters to me. It's like I have no problem working more hours when I need to work more hours. But, yeah, that's that's where it would break. I say no a lot, uh, you know, to to projects, you know, that if – and it's not just because of bandwidth. Sometimes it's just not a fit because that's part of this as well. It's like you want to work with people you want to work with. But um, yeah, uh, th- that's how it would break. If I took, if I got greedy and tried to take on more than I can handle, then that's one way it breaks for sure. So tell me about something that I was going to say major process break. I don't know if that's the right phrasing, but where have you messed up? So for instance, I've seen this before. I suck at anything mathematical. So if I had to do my accounts, oh boy. Big problem, massive problem. Uh, it's gone wrong 100% before I even started. Mm. Uh, legal paperwork, like if I had to make contracts to sign with my clients, oh boy, big problem. Mm. Not my remit at all. I know for a fact that would be me and that's a lot of people. What's yours been? Uh, that's easy. Um, I'm direct. So I do a lot of coaching and not everybody can, not everybody likes the direct style of communication. So I think that's the, 
the one for me that I, that where I mess up is being wherewithal about who you're communicating to, even though you're you not every not every SDR is ready to hear it so frank. And um, when you're trying to help people improve, there's a certain way of delivering. So I'm always working on my delivery and how that, that can come across. Um, you know, I think that's that's where I break, you know, right where, where I mess up most. Um, and you know, I think not setting expectations is another one. The only other engagement that uh, I had to pull out of was when it started to creep into other areas where they wanted me to basically be an SDR high and hire SDRs on their behalf. And that's not the model I help you build an in-house team. And so that was early days where I was like taking anything that was had to do with sales development. Yeah, I can do it. Yeah, I can do it. So these days I'm pretty clear about what I can and cannot do. And I'm also very upfront and transparent upfront uh, that, Hey, I have a certain mode of communication, uh, not to give myself an out at all. Uh, but I, you know, I'm here to, with your best interest, best interest of mine. And, you know, sometimes I might have to call your baby ugly, uh, jokingly, of course, but that's, you know, the, this is uh, the case of it often like that feels really counterintuitive but i've heard you know if you talk to any enterprise rep when you tell someone that the price is higher for some reason the close ratio goes up a little bit it's bizarre how it works like that just the the perceived value and the boundaries and those things for some reason you you feel weird saying it but it works and for, and you gain respect and you gain obviously the perks of the boundaries as well for some reason yeah. And then the perks, that's the best part. So then once they've heard that message and it's resonated with them and you've actually tested the waters early in the engagement a couple of times where you're saying, well, let's take it back. Let's take a step back and let's review this. Maybe think about it that way. And you kind of test their ability to be receptive to those direct feedbacks. Um, then you're, you're in a comfortable place as well, right? Like, you no, know, this isn't a matter of being disrespectful or being rude. It's just sometimes you want to, you have to not mix words. And a certain type of personality might take that a certain way. It's less with executives and founders um, that have that issue. It's more when I'm dealing with, you know, people who are early in their career and have a certain expectation of what a corporate environment might look like. And the advantage I tell them is I don't work for your company and I don't, you know, I, you know, I, I have a certain neutral uh, ability to speak in a certain way that doesn't affect like, our, our relationship long term because a manager will maybe not tell you what you want, you know, tell you things that he wants to say because they're trying, they're worried about their relationship with you and keeping that in a certain state. I am less worried about that and more worried about the skill development and the results and what's best for the company. I don't get that from you. I don't, I can't see it in the way that you speak, you being like really direct that you upset someone, but no, I mean, you it's, I've had the feedback. I've had the feedback and I, you know, it, and it's, but the, that's the thing that I thrive on is, you know, after every interview I run and in my podcast, I ask, give me feedback, tell me what can I do better? So I'm, and I'm very open about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, even in my podcast, I'll disagree with people, which you know, you don't really see a lot in podcasts. But people mm. are always kind of you know, trying to I speak hate that amenable. When it's like, oh, I love what you said there. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, oh exactly. God, like, you just said yeah, like, the almost, sky's blue. Oh, I love that. And you're like, Man, come on. <laughs> well, for me right now, it's the AI thing. People are obsessed with, oh, AI won't replace people. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And so every time I hear that in a, in a podcast, I'm sorry, I disagree. And I give my argument. I think that great, it creates, to your point, uh, a level of respect as well, is that you, you have a unique thought and you have something that you believe in. And it makes for better engagement, probably overall in a podcast. But yeah, I think that's the the area that... Uh, I'm always mindful of, you know, you'll talk to another client. They'll say, no, that's never happened. You know, Derek has always been, and I try to be encouraging. I try to be motivational. I, I'm big on that. You see my Instagram. Um, but at the same time, very matter of fact, and I don't, you know, want people to take advantage of great opportunities that they're in. And then sometimes I have to remind people that they're you're kind of being soft. You're kind of making excuses and you, you're not being accountable. You're not being well-disciplined, but you can be. And here are some ways to do that. And again, not everybody wants to hear that truth. Speaking of the podcast, as a, as a little thing to close up before uh, before I ask our final question, okay, why? I know that you do um, a lot of them, and uh, that's sort of your style and way that you're doing it. So kudos for the work that goes into it. I know firsthand. Um, I, I'm on it. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Why? Tomorrow. And um, and what's your goal with it? Uh, the why number one is to get better. Uh, you go from engagement to engagement as a consultant, and you always you're frequently seeing what's not working. 
And I needed a reliable input model that could keep me fresh as a consultant so that when I go from engagement to engagement, I'm bringing fresh insights and best practices and what's cutting edge in terms of technology. So this is number one, an input for me to get better. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, there's also the networking effect of it. It's an opportunity to connect with people like you and other people out there who are in the, you know, in the ecosystem that I want to have closer relationships with and see how that might impact us mutually. And yeah, I mean, as a, as a, in, as a solopreneur, uh, who wants to build a personal brand and a corporate brand and these sorts of things, I think it's paramount that uh, I get out there and the, the podcast specifically for me, I feel like it's a medium that I'm comfortable with. Uh, I'm not the best writer. I've tried blogging and, and that sort of thing. So I'm comfortable on camera. I feel like I'm comfortable speaking. Uh, so I think it's a medium that works well for me. What's its name? Just so that everyone here can go and find it. It's called the Sales Consultant Podcast. You can find it anywhere you get your uh, podcast, including YouTube. Wonder where you got the name from. Just thinking. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to make it simple. You know, like uh, I, and that was the thing that stopped me for a long time. I was like, what am I going to call it? And what's it going to be about? And you want to get it perfect, you know? And yeah, that's when I realized, like, why don't you just call it what you do? And yeah, I, I'm not opposed to people knowing me as the sales consultant down the road. If that happens serendipitously, then cool. But uh, no, this is. Primarily, you know, the audience are, are revenue leaders, number one, giving them insights to what's working out there. As I do this research and look to get better, I'm that's it's a channel directly into revenue leaders. They can basically get free uh, consultations with all these people that I interview. Right. And I, do, and I put a lot of work into prepping. I even do prep calls, which I know is controversial. And uh, but you know, I put a lot of work into making sure that's a really good episode. So there, there, there's that piece. Another side of the audience are other consultants and I go to market fashion as well. I have sales enablement consultants that I interview, um, marketing consultants. So I have a lot of consultants that tune in that might want to understand and learn about how to get into the game, how to manage their own practice and so forth. Actually, the next call I have after, after this is with a guy named Jason Pearl, who is a sales consultant himself. Cool. Well, um, in the, in a minute or two, cause we've got to jump for, uh, in a sec, how do you self-educate? Uh, I know you obviously you have the podcast and that's kind of your thing, but, um, do you listen, do you read other stuff? Yeah, I listen to a ton of podcasts. Um, uh, Harvard business review is one of my favorites. Um, I guess you can see from behind me, I, I read a lot. Um, I make time every morning, every evening, if I can, and randomly, you know, if I'm at my desk right now, I'm reading Amp It Up um, by Frank Slootman, chairman, CEO of Snowflake. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, I take online courses for the tech as well. So I'll go to Zoom Info University, HubSpot University, Salesforce, Trail, uh, Trailhead, and I'll do those courses pretty intently too as part of my certification processes. Got you. Okay, dude. Where can people find you? And uh, and we're out of here. Yeah. Uh, go to the website, threelinksales.com. The number three, linksales.com. Uh, check me out on LinkedIn or Instagram. Derek is three link sales. Awesome. Well, thanks very much for coming on, dude. I, uh, I look forward to my episode coming out too. Uh, we might be around about the same type of time in close by. Perfect. So that would be good. Perfect. And uh, yeah, like I said, everyone, thanks very much for listening. If you made it this far. This show is brought to you by all the clothes of Vanilla Soft Company, but you already know that. If you're listening, make sure you give us a five-star review. You know I'd love you forever if you did that. Subscribe, whatever you're listening. It's on everything. I promise you, literally everything. My LinkedIn Live, actually, every every Tuesday, I believe, anyway, about 10 a.m. And, uh, and that's it. That's the rest of the show. And we'll see you next one, guys. Thanks very much.